Hi. Hi. My name is Jane Thorpe, and I'm the Executive Director of Meridian Herald. Welcome to Meridian Herald's Folk Advent Program, created by the Reverend Fred Craddock and Stephen Darcy over 20 years ago. In fact, I heard somebody say it's been here for 27 years. <laughs> Long time. Meridian Herald programs, like this Folk Advent Program, have glorious music. They also have a sense of history and a sense of place, which I'm sure you can feel right now. As Reverend Craddock said, people who have never heard this music before will feel as if they know it. We are grateful to the amazing Meridian Chorale and soloists, to Leah Calvert and her band, to Reverend Brooks Holyfield and Stephen Darcy, to Oxford College, to David Galler and the Pierce Program of Religion, and to the Oxford Historical Shrine Society for inviting us. Meridian Herald has had a very exciting year. On December 1, Albany Records, a New York classical music label, released our new CD, Bound for the Promised Land, featuring what is believed to be the great opera star Jessie Norman's last performance. On that CD, she's joined by the Meridian Chorale, the Morehouse and Spelman Glee Clubs, and the Vega String Quartet. The CD is narrated by Emory University's Robert Franklin and Pulitzer Prize winning uh, historian Taylor Branch. It is really something else. And about the music on this CD, the, uh, Steve Darcy was the music director, Dwight Andrews was the artistic director, and Dwight said, if we look into the music and the sound of one another, if we look into the eyes of one another, if we listen to one another, we can learn and grow and be changed. That is the power of great art. And what he said has absolute application to what we're doing here this afternoon. The CD is available up front for sale after the service, and you can also buy it on Amazon or, or any place else you, you buy your great music, and it's also on streaming services. Um, we have a new website with lots of music and lots of videos of the Meridian Chorale and our guest artists, also our calendar. Our next program is coming up really soon, Hope Sees a Star, a Yuletide program that's being presented in the uh, old DeKalb Courthouse in Decatur, Georgia. It's on, on December 17th at 7.30 p.m. Please come. It's our newest program. You'll be among our first audience for it if you come. There will be an offering during today's service. Please know that all contributions are tax deductible and that you can also donate online to Meridian, at meridianherald.org. Most of our programs are free and your gifts are really important to us. In your chair, if many of you have been here before, you know there's a short form to fill out so we can get your email information and add you to our mailing list to keep you up to date on Meridian Herald News. Thank you so much for coming today. Now, let us worship God together in this holy and historic place.
really fortunate. My name is Leah Calvert. I'm really fortunate to have some great friends and my husband up here playing with me today. Um, this is Tommy Sauter playing the bass for you guys. And um, Nick DeSebastian on guitar. And uh, Jared Womack, who we featured on that first uh, instrumental team. Nick's going to sing us a song right now. What's it called? Traveling the Highway Home. Traveling the Highway Home. <laughs> Traveling the highway home, traveling 
Welcome to this service. Its songs honor the people of Appalachia, one of the most culturally rich and diverse regions of the United States. Its songs and meditations observe the Christian festival of Advent, one of the most joyful and somber periods of the Christian calendar. Some of the songs and some of the meditations are somber, subdued, solemn. In the early church, Advent was a period of fasting and solemnity. It was like Lent in December. It, it was a period of waiting, waiting for the last judgment, waiting for the Christ who would judge all men and women at the end of time. And as you know, times of waiting can be anxious times. Some of the psalms and some of the meditations are joyful and exuberant. In the early church as now, Advent was also a period of celebration and joy. It was almost like Easter in December. It was a period of waiting for the birth of the child. Waiting for the child who would restore innocence and childlikeness to jaded and cynical men and women. As you know, times of waiting can also be exciting times. Advent was therefore a paradoxical time, solemnity and celebration, anxiety and excitement, judgment and redemption. And for many today who've never even heard of a liturgical calendar, it's a time of joy and sadness, happiness and sorrow, eager anticipation and worry. So it's no accident that in these Advent services we turn so often to the parables of Jesus. When we experience paradox, Music and parables seem more fitting than logic and propositions. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus traveled through the cities and villages of Galilee teaching with parables. And more than once, his disciples were puzzled. What? What did that mean? What were you saying? And one of his answers to them was this. You know the secrets of the kingdom of God. But for others, I teach in parables so that seeing they may not see, and hearing, they, they may, may not, not understand. understand. So that seeing, they may not see, and hearing, they may not understand. It's a puzzling statement. It's a disconcerting one, too, because we are among those who see without seeing and hear without understanding. At a minimum, at a minimum, 
the parables call for a good measure of humility. Jesus told this parable. A father had two sons. One asks him for his share of his inheritance and his father gives it to him. The son takes the money and squanders it and he falls into poverty. His, nation, his neighbors don't give him anything except the one who gives him a job feeding pigs. But the son ends up envying the pigs so he decides to return to his father's house where even the servants have food to spare. And he calculates, I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as a servant. And I'll sound so convincing that he'll have to take me back, at least as a servant. But his father sees him coming, and before he even has a chance to say anything, his father runs to him and embraces him, bring quickly the robe and put it on him, and then the father throws a party. No conditions, no bargaining, sheer gift, sheer grace. But the elder brother hears about the party and this makes him angry. So he goes to the father and says, I have served you all these years. I have never disobeyed you, but you have never thrown a party for me. Son, the father says, son, Everything I have is yours. The younger son, the pig feeder, <laughs> calculates what to say to bargain with the father. Just treat me as a servant. That's all I'm asking. asking. The elder son, the party powder, bargains more openly. Uh, I've worked for years. I deserve a party. He doesn't, and he's getting one. Everybody except the father lives in a transactional world, a world of calculation and deal-making, uh, of hard bargains, of winners and losers, deserving and undeserving, uh, up and down world with a few up and more down, a world of corner cutters and con men. We know that world. But the father, the father builds a relational world. What's important is his relationship with his two sons, and he's utterly merciful to both. Bring quickly the robe 
and put it on him. My son, everything I have is yours. With the Father, it's mercy all the way down. One time, when the crowds clustered around Jesus, he taught them this parable. A rich man had bountiful crops, so he pulled down his barns to build larger ones. And in these barns, he said, I will store all my grain and my goods, and I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods. They're laid up for many years. So take your ease, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So also, Jesus says, are the people who lay up treasure for themselves and are not rich toward God. 
H. Richard Niebuhr, who taught at Yale Divinity School, once reflected on a quotation from the Protestant reformer Martin Luther. Whatever your heart clings to and has confidence in, that is really your God. And it follows, Niebuhr concluded, that most people honor many gods, but in the long run, he said, we honor all of them in vain because we and all our gods, our goods, all our causes, all our ideas, all the beings on whom we de- rely to save us from worthlessness are doomed to pass away. All our gods die. But something abides when all else passes away. It's the source of all and the end of all. It surrounds our life as the the great abyss into which all things plunge and as the great source from which they all come. Call it what you will. Call it God. Call it the way things are. Call it the slayer the destroyer of all our goods and gods. But some people, moved by Jesus' teachings and his acts of mercy, call it friend. They have attached their confidence to this one beyond the many as a friend upon whom they can rely and whom they can trust. They can relax. They can be vulnerable. They're not anxious about their lives. They are rich unto God. And they don't worry very much about their barns.
Jesus enjoyed lunch with sinners. He became known as someone who received sinners and shared meals with them, and his opponents criticized him for this, and he replied to them with two short parables. A shepherd had a hundred sheep, and he lost one, so he left the ninety-nine and went to look for the lost one, and when he found it, he threw a party. There's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents, Jesus says, than over ninety-nine righteous persons. A woman had ten coins, and she lost one, so she lit a lamp and searched the house until she found it. And when she found it, she threw a party, and the angels in heaven rejoiced. They rejoice over even one sinner who repents. Now, New Yorker cartoonists have had a wonderful time with repentance. A robed man carries a sign, Repent, the end is near, dial 1-800-REPENT. Another one's sign reads, Repent, the end is near, go to www.endisnear.com. Still another, Repent, or at least acknowledge that you've made a mistake. One man carries a sign saying, repent. Another man carries a sign saying, no. (laughs) Delegates to a political convention carry signs that read, Texas, Georgia, Maine, sinners repent, New York, South Carolina. A dinosaur stands with a sign saying, repent, the end is only 150 million years away. A turkey carries a sign right after Thanksgiving saying simply, repent. (laughs) The humor fits the parables. The shepherd finds the sheep and they throw a party. The joy reaches to heaven. The woman finds her coin and she throws a party. The angels in heaven rejoice. Now, to repent is to turn. It's to turn away from one way of living to another and to make this turn again and again and again. To repent is to learn to live outside ourselves. It's to overcome the pull of the ego that keeps our eyes focused on ourselves, our needs, our goods. To repent is to live attentively, concentrating our attention not on ourselves, but on the person in front of us, whether friend or stranger, on the poor and marginal, on little children in cages and their grieving parents, on Habitat for Humanity and Doctors Without Borders and In-Town Collaborative Ministries and the Atlanta Mission. To live repentantly is to live with humility, to accept that we might be wrong and often are. It's to acknowledge the humanity of our opponents and to escape the weight, the burden of living angrily, of nursing our grievances and stewing over slights. It's a great relief to repent. When we self-preoccupied human beings repent, and learn to laugh at ourselves, to live laughingly, then the angels in heaven laugh too. They rejoice. They slap one another on the back. They throw a party. They read New Yorker cartoons to each other. 
Sometimes I fantasize that every single person in the United States will simply repent. Now, wouldn't the angels get a good laugh out of that? Jesus told this parable about a banquet. The host invited all his friends, and when the banquet menu was prepared, he sent for them to come, but they all had excuses for why they couldn't. One had to examine his oxen, one had to check his fields, one had to attend to his bride. So the master tells the helpers to go into the lanes and alleyways and bring the poor and the maimed and the blind and the lame. But there was still room, so he told his helpers to comb the highways and bridges and can compel people to come in because he said none of the people who had been invited would taste of the banquet. Well, why not? Couldn't they change their minds? Was he locking them out? Or did he simply know them too well? After all, they wouldn't have known what to do or to say at this kind of banquet. How could they be comfortable at a banquet with the poor, the broken, the maimed, the blind, and the lame. Would we be comfortable at a banquet with the broken, the maimed, the blind, and the lame? Well, you know what Jesus said in that parable? He said that we, we who see without seeing and hear without understanding, we are the broken and the maimed and the blind and the lame. And that banquet, it's for us.
Jesus was often criticized for spending time with sinners, and on one occasion he replied to his critics with a very puzzling parable. A rich man fired his manager because of excessive waste, but he allowed the man to manage the farm while he was on a short trip. The manager used the time to make friends so that when he lost his job, they would welcome him into their houses. So he called on the people who owed the rich man a debt. How much do you owe? 900 gallons of olive oil. Then take your bill and reduce it by half and do it quickly. How much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat. Make it 800. When the rich man returned, he saw right away what had happened, but he commended the dishonest manager because he had acted so shrewdly. It is good, he said, to use dishonest wealth to make friends. I don't understand that. (laughs) I don't see what he meant. The rich man commands, commends, commends the manager who has tried to cheat him out of 450 gallons of olive oil and 200 bushels of wheat. It's as if the money is irrelevant. The, the 450 gallons are, are irrelevant. The 200 bushels are irrelevant. It's as, it's as if only the friends are relevant. Oh, Only the friends are relevant.
Now it's time for our offering. Let us pray. Creator God, you have given us sight, but we cannot yet see. We long to enter into the joy and glory of your heavenly banquet here. Therefore, we now offer our gifts and our lives to thee. Amen. Rather than I Do Mia, which is the song printed in the program, I'm going to sing uh, the tune named Asheville. Jesus told this parable. In a certain town, there was a judge. He was an ornery character. He cared not for God, and he cared not for people. He also did not care for a certain widow who was seeking a just resolution in a dispute with an adversary. Vindicate me, she begs. Give me justice. And he refused, but she continued to come. Vindicate me. Give me justice. But he refused. Until the judge said to himself, Though I care not for God or for other people, I will vindicate her. I will give her justice. If I don't, she will wear me out. End of parable. God will vindicate those who continue to call on him, says Jesus. They should not lose heart. But the parable is ambiguous, isn't it? Uh, The judge is indifferent. He's unrighteous. He He cares not for God. He cares not for other people. He helps the widow only because she becomes a bother. She threatened to wear him out. Not exactly a depiction of the God whom Jesus preached about, mercy all the way down. But what if the main character in the parable is not the judge, but the widow. The widow sought vindication, sought justice. The judge said no. He continued to say no. She continued to come to him. She didn't despair. She didn't give up. 
she didn't lose heart. We are surrounded by injustices. We're depressed by the mistreatment of the powerless. We're distressed by the callousness toward the suffering of the weak. We're discouraged by powers and principalities that treat people with disregard or malice. Even in our own families, among our friends, in our communities, we're grieved by divisions, hurt feelings, pain. We look to our future with some anxiety. Will we too, or our children, or our grandchildren, or their grandchildren encounter a painful judgment because of things we have done or left undone? What will mark and diminish their lives as a result of our changing climate? So many burdens, so many dangers, so many sorrows, Justice is slow in coming, and we are weary. It's enough to make us fall into despair. But let's not fall into despair. Let's not lose heart. The widow sought justice, and the judge said no. The widow sought justice, and the judge said no, until the judge said yes.
Jesus told two short parables about the kingdom of God. It's like a grain of mustard seed that grows and becomes a tree, and the birds make nests in its branches. It's like a leaven which a woman hides in three measures of meal till it's leavened. A mustard seed and a leaven hidden in three measures of meal. Pretty small and insignificant, hardly noticeable amid the clamor, invisible, overlooked, ignored by cable television news, ignored by the front pages and by talk radio. But maybe the seed is growing where we least expect it. Maybe the tiny bit of leaven is doing its work somewhere unnoticed, even as I speak. A congregational food bank, a habitat house, a small church in the mountains of Tennessee that opens its doors so that immigrants can hold services in Spanish. A protest rally, a march, a scientific laboratory, a judge's chambers, maybe even where legislators gather. Just a mustard seed, unnoticed, but it's growing. Maybe it's growing simply wherever, wherever people keep believing in truth and speaking truthfully. The followers of Jesus once asked him when the kingdom of God would come. The kingdom of God, he said, is in the midst of you. Let's pray. Hidden and transcendent God, you are an infinite mystery beyond our knowing and our speaking. You transcend our thoughts and elude our attempts to enclose you in our words. Merciful and gracious God, you are present in our shortest breath and in the beating of our hearts. You are as close to us as we are to ourselves. You have embraced us as our very life. We offer our gratitude for the gifts you have given, our lives, our loves, our friends, our families. We give thanks for the moments of happiness with friends and loved ones and for the times when we have connected with strangers. We give thanks for Jesus the Christ Jesus, the teller of parables, Jesus in the crib and on the cross. In this Advent season of anxiety and joy, we, we await the birth of the innocent child. We confess that we are anxious about matters small and large, from Christmas gifts and Christmas menus to the collapse of our fragile planet. We confess that we have not been as responsible as we could have been. Forgive us for our failures, small and large. We've defined people by their opinions and orientations, their poverty and wealth, their status in the eyes of our society, and forgotten that all of us are still all too human when we are seen from within the light of your unimaginable and unimaged love. Grant us the widow's persistence and her quest for justice, the parent's boundless love, and the happiness of the guest at the banquet. May you be present with us even when we think that you are absent. This we ask in the name of one who spoke in parables. Amen.
Go in peace. Let's have a hand for our band. And the Meridian Corral. And our preacher, Brooks Holyfield. Thank you all for coming and have a blessed Advent and Christmas.